point where I, I was just ready to quit. I had had enough. I was, I was at a loss. I didn't know where to go. Our first scripture reading this morning is from Genesis. And this is the promise that God made to Abraham. See, Abraham and Sarah, they were getting along in age. And they hadn't had a son yet. Abraham, Abraham hadn't had a son yet. And, and God had promised him that his descendants would be like the sands of the sea. That they would be more numerous than the stars in the sky. He had promised to Abraham that he would be blessed for a thousand generations. And yet he had no son. So he asked God, um, I'm, I don't mean to, you know, I, I don't mean to question you, but you, you promised me that I was going to have, that, that I was going to be the father of many nations, and I'm not the father of anybody. I, I'm, I'm to the point now where I'm, I'm 100 years old. Even, even if by some chance I, I became a father, I'm so old now, I can't, I can't do anything about it. And he said, on top of that, Sarah, she's old too. And she can't even have a baby anymore. So, God, what am I supposed to do? And God said to him, The Lord appeared again to Abraham near the oak grove belonging to the Mamre. One day, Abraham was sitting at the entrance to the tent during the hottest part of the day. He looked up and noticed three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he ran to meet them and welcomed them, bowing low to the ground. My Lord, he said, if it pleases you, stop here for a while. Rest in the shade of this tree while water is brought to wash your feet. And since you've honored your servant with this visit, let me prepare some food to refresh you before you continue on your journey. All right, they said, do as you said. So Abraham ran back to the tent and said to Sarah, Hurry, get three large measures of your best flour, knead it in the dough, and break, bake some bread. So she did. As they were eating, one of them said to him, Where is Sarah, your wife? These are strangers. They said, Where is Sarah, your wife? She's inside the tent, Abraham replied. Then one of them said, I will return to you about this time next year, and your wife Sarah will have a son. Wait, what? Wait, what? I will return to you about this time next year, and your wife Sarah will have a son. Sarah was listening to this conversation from the tent, and Abraham and Sarah were both very old by this time. And Sarah was long past the age of having children. So she laughed silently to herself. How could a worn out woman like me enjoy such pleasure, especially since my master, my husband, is so old? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the Lord, the Lord. Now first we started out with three strangers. Three men walking by, and Abraham went out to them and said, you know, you're trapped. come on in here. And, and that was the custom, to welcome travelers in. And one of those three, if you've done any studying, you will know that one of those three was Christ incarnate, was God himself visiting Abraham. Abraham, Abraham had talked to to God, and God had spoken to Abraham and told him all these things. You're going to be the father of many nations. You're going to have generation after generation more numerous than the stars in the sky. And he said, wait, what? That, that, that can't, can't be right. I mean, I, I, I appreciate it and all, but I'm like 105 years old. That's, that's kind of, and she's, she's almost right there with me. How, I, even if we have them, what are we supposed to do with them? <laughs> the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? 
Why did she say, can an old woman like me have a baby? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return about this time next year and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she denied it, saying, I didn't laugh. But the Lord said, no, you did laugh. <laughs> and if I were her, I'd laugh too. <laughs> God has made to us a promise. He has given us His word that we are His chosen people. Now wait, wait, what I just said. The Hebrew nation is God's chosen people. That's right. They are and they were from earliest time. But, but guess what? Because the Lord, because Jesus said to Abraham, I'll be back here in a year and you will have a son. Because even though he wanted to say, wait, what? Instead, he said, thanks be to God. I'm almost to middle age. My children are, are grown. And I see some people who are Debbie and my age or just a little younger and they're having children. They're having children. I, I would have to say, thank you, Lord, but what am I supposed to do with them? They want to run around and they want, they want to be happy and jumping and playing and I can't do any of that. Well, I could, but I'd suffer for a week. God said to Abraham, God, God said to Abraham, you will be the father of many nations. God said, you are my chosen people. Abraham was the father of many nations, but we are his chosen people. So if we're chosen, why do we suffer? If we're chosen, why do we stand by day after day and not see God's promises? We're, we're His chosen people. We, we have been, according to Paul, grafted into the body. Jesus was more than our Savior. Jesus was more than our Savior. He was the glue that grafted us into the chosen family. He was the link for us to God. Paul writes to the, to the Galatians, before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. God chose his people, and his people said, no thank you, we're just fine the way we are. And then his family went into slavery in Egypt. And they suffered under Pharaoh for 400 years. And God sent Moses to free his people. And his people were freed. And guess what they said? We liked it better back in Egypt. We liked it better back in Egypt. God said, I am giving you all of the land flowing with milk and honey, and all you have to do is go and take it. No thanks. 
We'll keep wandering around. Those guys look big. They're scary. I don't want to go over there. Why is it that when God speaks to us, when God tells us something, we either ignore it or we say no thanks? I, I, I know that His plan is perfect. I know that His will is perfect. I know that He has all of us firmly in the palm of His hand, and yet we still say, no thanks. I'm fine the way I am. Guess what? We're not. We're not fine the way we are. They were not fine in Egypt. They were not fine wandering around in the desert. Why do we look at our present circumstance and say, well, I've got it good. Why, why, do we, why do we do that? God has so much more for you. He has so much that He wants to give you. And yet we say, I'm going to talk good. Paul continues in chapter 4. He says, think of it this way. If a father dies and leaves an inheritance to his young children, those children are not much better off than slaves until they grow up, even though they actually owned everything their father had. They have to obey their guardians until they reach whatever age their father set. And that's the way it is with us before Christ. We were like children. We were the slaves to the basic spiritual principles of this world. But when the right time came, God sent His Son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent Him to buy freedom for us, we who were slaves to the law, so that He could adopt us as His very own children. And because we are His children, not because we will be His children, we are. We are. Because we are His children, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father, Papa, Daddy. Where are you? Now you're no longer a slave, but you're God's own child. And since you were his child, God has made you his heir. You are heir. 421. It's 421. Let, me, let me break this down for you. The wrong verse. You are heir to the kingdom of God. You are sons and daughters of the king of kings. You are. It doesn't, maybe it doesn't feel like it. But stop saying, I'm okay. Stop saying, no, I'm fine, really. Stop saying, I don't really need your help. In Sunday school this morning, I told the kids, what would you do if I promised that after church I was going to take you to McDonald's and instead I drove you straight home? They said, of course. I'd be mad. I said, yeah, you would be. And I said, what would that make me if I said I was going to take you to McDonald's and instead I drove you straight home? You're a liar. Kids don't, right? You're a liar. I said, so then my actions have to match my words, right? Yeah. Yes. Your actions have to. If you say you're going to do something, then you better do it. People, God is truth with a capital T. And what He said, He will do. What He has said, He will do. God is not a man that He should lie. All that He says to you is true. So why do we stand there and say, No oh, thanks. I'm fine. We're not fine. Our actions are not matching our words. We can stand and say we're fine all we want, 
But our circumstance says something else. Louis stood up here and said, I, I know I should be reading the Word. I, I know I should be praying. And, and, I, and I haven't been. And I know that's why the devil attacked me. Truth with a capital T. When was the last time you told someone you would do something and then you didn't do it? For me, it was this week. I, 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 you have my most heartfelt apology. I promise to do a lot of things and I have promised so many people so many things, I forget what I promised. I forget that I was supposed to be at point A when I'm at point B and, and point C. I don't know. I'm lost. And when my circumstance, when my actions don't match my words, people go, liar. You big fat liar. I don't like, I don't like that I say one thing and do something else. And you know what? Paul said exactly the same thing. He said, I don't like it that I say I'm going to do something and I do the opposite. I can't stand that about myself. But I do it anyway. And then I stand there and scratch my head and wonder why things aren't going the way I think they should. Do we stand on the promises of God or do we look at God and say, no, I'm fine. I'm doing quite well, thank you. I mean, just look at me. I know, ladies. I know. If you can't laugh at yourself.
Do you? Do you have, do you have your circumstance under control? Because if you do, man, tell me how you did it. We'll write a book and we'll get rich. Well, I will because I'll just give it all away. But we, we have got to stop. We have got to stop saying, God, I love you. God of heaven, you are wonderful. God of, and then the next day or the next minute, start swearing at the TV because your football team lost. Man, Notre Dame got beat. That's right. They had the winning touchdown and they got called back. Man. Right? Don't we get that way? Don't we? Don't we? With one, what do we used to call it? Talking on both sides. Of it, we say, God, I love you. Be merciful God, thank you for all that you've done. I can't believe that just happened. I cannot believe what that person said about me. Why, how dare they? I'm going to go right to church and I'm going to start. Wait, what? Have I missed something? I don't think the instructions were that difficult. And if you don't understand them, read them. Sorry. Well, I say I'm sorry, but I'm not ready. Stop. Stop acting like everything is okay when it's not. And stop refusing God's help because you've got it all under control. Because you, you know what? You don't. When we were talking in Sunday, Sunday school this morning, I said, I don't know how people who don't believe in God, I don't know how they don't just live in terror and fear. Right? It's... This argument has been presented before to intelligent men having a conversation. One says to the other, if God doesn't exist, then all that I've done in my life is still for the good of mankind. But if God exists, all that you've done is for nothing. If you don't give everything you have, everything that you are, if you don't give it to God, everything you've done, all that you are, nothing. Paul uses this phrase that is, to me, maybe one of the most beautiful in the Bible. And he says, we have been we have been given the right to say Abba, Papa. We, we call out to him like little children, hands lifted up, Daddy, help me. How fast did you run when your children fell and said, Mommy, help me! Or Daddy, ow, oh, help me! How fast did you run? God didn't have to run, he's right there. And all you have to do is look up and say, Daddy, help me. So let me break this down for you. You don't have everything under control. You can't do it on your own. You need God. And He already called you His prized possession. He wants you to say, Daddy, help me. That's it. That's all He wants. And when you give all that you have to Him, when you give everything that you have and everything that you are, when you give it to Him, He will give to you a blessing that you can't possibly imagine. Pressed down, shaken together, running over. Pressed down, shaken together, running over. He will bless you. Give it to God. 
Stop trying to win a battle that you can't possibly win and give it to God. And you will be rewarded in ways you cannot possibly imagine. I'm going to finish with this one, this one thing. Last week, I said, who is here in this building because someone asked you to be here? I asked that question, and about 15 or 20 people raised their hand. There are a lot more of you here today, so I'm going to ask it again. How many of you are here today because someone asked you to come? Raise your hand. See, I look at the hands and I see bountiful blessings from God. And then I look and I see a lot of empty chairs. People, I don't have anything to say. I, don't, I, I have nothing to say. But God has things that He once said and He wants you to hear. And if you don't take the time to tell somebody that you love them and then show them with your deeds, you're turning your back and saying, I've got this. Let's do what we need to do, what we were commanded to do. Love God and give Him everything we've got and love our neighbors so that we can say, Daddy, help me. Amen.